Israel is in the desert. The people have been freed from slavery in Egypt. They have received God's commandments and are preparing to enter the promised land. The journey takes much longer than expected. Forty years have passed. The older generation is almost gone. From the three siblings' leaders, only Moses is left. And he has just heard that he won't live much longer. Camped on Mount Hor, they got the green light to enter the address of Canaan into their GPS. Finally, the season of walking in circles is behind them, but as they start to move, Again, they fall into their favorite sin. Welcome to Numbers 21, one of the most famous stories in the Bible, so famous that it's also part of the culture. You've probably seen this symbol. The snake wrapped around the top of a pole. Why has this figure become a symbol of medicine. I am not sure if there's a connection, but for all sakes, I will make one. I'm going to use ideas from medicine as a key to understand this story. Let's learn about a disease that needs to be healed. Let's study the symptoms and the treatment and the antidote. The symptoms. Israel's favorite sin in the desert, as you know, is complaining. Numbers 21 tells us of the 14th time, you heard it, 14th time that they did that, according to some records. And it will be the last until they reach their destination. The target of the protest now reaches up to heavens. They spoke against before Moses, or Moses and Aaron. This time, they raised their voice against God himself. Perhaps this explains why God reacted as he did. He sent poisonous snakes that infested the whole camp. In Hebrew, the snakes are called fiery, not because they are on fire, but because they burn with their venom. Those who were bitten suffered from a burden inside, a thirst that ended in death. Some experts see a sign here. How so? Let's take a look at the complaint. What are the people complaining about this time? The manna. They hate the food that God miraculously brings down from heaven every morning. They hate what they were almost thankful for. For a long time, the manna served them well. But as time goes by, they begin to get sick and tired of it. Verse 5 is kind of comical. <laughs> we don't have any food. We are already sick of this bad food. Sound like my children opening the fridge. <laughs> there's nothing to eat here, meaning there's nothing here that we like to eat. Nothing is good enough after a while. Every gratitude in our hearts has an expiration date. No joy lasts two or three setbacks. We fall in love with someone and after a while they either don't fit anymore or they do but we've lost that feeling of wow how blessed I am to have this person with me. We learn a new skill we buy something new, we get excited about it, and then it fades away. The work it took so long for us to achieve, 
It was the Rolling Stones who said, I can get no satisfaction. Watch the videos on YouTube, celebrities, millionaires, talking about glory and dissatisfaction. It's impressive. Jim Carrey at the Golden Globe 2016 about never having enough. Those things that we dream of, those who have gotten there, they look at us and they say, it does not fulfill. You get to the top, guess what? You want more. You always want more. It's the burning hole inside of us, swallowing everything. No matter what I put in there, at first it's wonderful until it gets boring. The thirst for more. Symptom. Symptom of a disease. The disease is old. It began in Genesis, when everything was perfect. Until Adam and Eve listened to, how curious, a serpent. He basically said, you have everything except one thing, except a tree. Oh no, that's not fair. You should be able to eat of everything without exception. And... When the serpent's spiritual poison passed through their hearts, the burning began. The consuming thirst, the unquenchable discontent. What was happening with the poison of the snakes in the desert was a picture of the poison that Satan had planted in the heart of every human being. And the disease is not only old, but profound. Because ultimately, it's not only discontent, not only a lack of faith, but an attack on God himself. Look at how they connected disgust with food with a direct attack on God's goodness, with an attempt to murder the very mercy of God. Look at, at their accusation once more. There is no good food here. We are going to die. That's why God took us from Egypt. It was all a sadistic joke. Just to see us starving to death here in the desert. They are telling God, your rescue. The Red Sea was not out of love. You were playing with us. What you gave us, it's worse than slavery. Ouch. Are we that different? Don't we also find it difficult to walk with God when we are in the desert? Don't we also question His mercy from time to time? We are too? Infected. The inability to trust in God's love and the attack on His grace when we don't get what we want. Is that why, God, you brought us out of Egypt? Have you thought like that? Imagine how much that must hurt in God's heart. Try to remember when you love someone, when you took a risk for someone, when you saved someone, when you helped someone out, and because something did not work out, the person turned against you, forgetting all the good, all the acts of blessings that you did. Has that ever happened to you? If so, you can imagine a little of how God feels when we do that. The disease is old. It comes from Eden. It's deep. It's ultimately an attack of unbelief in God's own loving 
character and the disease is deadly, is dangerous because unfortunately, sometimes we only realize it until we actually feel it in our own skin. We don't suspect the diagnosis. We don't admit that we need help. The people of Israel did not see what was really eating them until they were eaten and began to die. They didn't see the poison in their souls until they felt it in their bodies. We've talked about the symptoms and we talked about the disease. Now let's see what God do to heal us. First, the wake-up treatment. It starts with bitter prescription. God does not always use discipline, suffering, to call us to repent. But when there is no other way, you bet he will do it. If, in order to present, prevent us from dying eternally, if in order to prevent us from being destroyed spiritually, God has to allow some momentary problem, have no doubt, out of love, He will do it. When we do not listen, when we despise the pedagogy of love, the treatment may have a bitter antibiotic in the prescription. In the story, it was necessary and it worked. Look how the people, when they felt it on their skin, they realized it. They exchanged their complaint for this confession. We have sinned against Moses and against the Lord. No more playing the blame game. We may find God's discipline disproportionate, but the Israelites did not. We may be shocked when a father or a mother uses tough love, but their children, when they come to their sense, they don't do it. I have lost count how many times someone has said to me, Pastor, God had to knock me off my horse like Saul. Because I couldn't see it, what I was doing. The best thing God did for me was knock me off my horse. The Hebrews in the desert, they didn't come to Moses saying, Hey Moses, we have sinned, but this is ridiculous. The snakes are just an exaggeration. No. We have sinned against the Lord. That's it. They saw. They recognize it. What is happening is our own fault. And what God is doing is for our own good. Finally, the healing medicine. Which is the answer to this story? It will be found many centuries later, one night, in one conversation. A man called Nicodemus knows everything about the religion, does everything his holy books tells him to do, but he has trouble to sleep, doubts about salvation, so he seeks out Jesus desperately and he asks, what am I missing? Jesus answers, you need to be born from above. From above. Don't miss the clue here. And then Jesus says, you know the Old Testament, Nico. Then remember Moses. Remember the serpent in the desert. What that was, I am. 
As Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. The serpent was a sign pointing to me. God loved so much the world that I am here to fulfill Numbers 21 once and for all and for everyone to be healed. In what sense is Jesus like the bronze serpent, we may ask? The answer is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 21. He who knew no sin, God made to be sin for us, so that in him we might be made his righteousness. The serpent on the pole was the icon of evil. He gave the healing medicine, but he reminded them of the sting, of the poison, the suffering. Jesus was never evil. He never represented suffering. But when he went to the cross, he took it on himself. He observed all of the reality and the consequences of sin upon himself. Jesus took what all of us, infected by sin, deserved. He took upon himself our punishment so that we don't have to. Jesus becomes the serpent who is the opposite of what he was so that we can become the opposite of what we are. He takes away all the evil from us. He takes away all the sin from us. And he presents us before God as acceptable, as holy, as righteous, as forgiven. From above, high and lifted up, Jesus on the cross looked at you today. And he say, healed, forgiven. Your problem was too big for you. Twelve steps wouldn't do it. No amount of good works would. But because of my death, now it's done. Jesus did not send a snake hunter there in the desert. He didn't tell Moses to make a snake antivenom because the only possible form of healing would have to come from above. Jesus, hide up on the cross, says to you, I am the eagle. I am the snake hunter. I defend you and I heal you. Trust me. Trust in my blood. Look at me. Just look. Interesting. Have you noticed? If God had said to be healed, you have to climb the pole. Only climbers of faith could do that if there's one. Only the stronger ones. He didn't even say, touch the pole. People didn't even have to crawl over the pole. A very weak person couldn't do it. Just look. The medicine in numbers was accessed just with a glance. The person could be alone. The person could be already hallucinating. It doesn't matter. Just look. It's that simple because it's for everyone. Even for the weakest. Especially for the weakest. With this very simple verb, look. God is highlighting that's always by grace. It's by faith, not by our own works. Many people, unfortunately, are relying on their own works for salvation. A lot of people, friends of ours, are feeling heavy and guilty like Nicodemus, and they cannot sleep. Because they think they need to prove their worth. Because they think they need to do this and that. So God will love them. Will God will love them more. We can tell them. Stop.
stop trusting in your own accomplishments and look at Christ's accomplishments for you. Look and rest. You look and you lift. He was like that. Immediately healed. That's how God works faith and grace and forgiven and love in us. The moment we look, the moment the Holy Spirit transferred our eyes, our trust, and placed them at Christ, since our baptism, we live. The antidote for forgiveness won on the cross is immediate. The process of living our lives, it continues. The process of growing up, maturing, it continues between ups and downs. We continue, it's not perfect, but the healing of God is instantaneous. You look with faith at Christ and that's it. You are healed. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Healed. I forgive you. Healed. Take and eat. Take and drink. Heaven, heavenly medicine for you. Healed. And it's like that. Healed and forgiven that we go forward into the promised land because the whole book of numbers especially this period in the desert it's precisely a metaphor for our lives because we are too in a pilgrimage we are nomads in this world and we are in the desert and we will not have it easy until we reach our final destination what do we do pastor hebrews 12 tells us we keep looking. We keep our eyes fixed on Christ, raised on high, on the altar and the finisher of our faith, constantly receiving His grace for each day because we need it, receiving His guidance for each day because we need it, always looking. To God crucified on a pole for us. Rest on that. And go live your life. And have sweet dreams. Amen.